The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to UMass Extension's Invasive Insect Webinar Series for 2023. I'm so excited to welcome so many folks here this morning and also just want to clarify, uh, we apologize for the confusion. I believe there may have been a mistake in some of our email messaging saying that uh, the series begins at 8.30. Uh, we are starting promptly here at 9, the original time. Again, so sorry about that. And I just want to clarify that today's program goes from 9 to uh, just about noon and that it will be the same uh, time frame for each of the three days in this webinar series. So the two dates coming up in February, uh, we're gonna get started at nine and run till approximately noon. So sorry again about that confusion. Um, I'll introduce myself before I forget. My name is Tawny Samiski. I'm an extension entomologist with UMass Extension's Landscape, Nursery and Urban Forestry Program. And I'm here today with Ellen and Jeffrey who are helping run things behind the scenes and might be answering some of the questions that you're putting in the, the question box and go to webinars control panel. And uh, momentarily we'll get uh, into our first presentation and introduce our speakers. But I do have a couple of announcements that I need to make while we're waiting for folks to continue to sign in. We're so excited we have over 800 folks registered around 850 today and so I hope everybody logs in this morning and joins us. All right, uh, first thing I want to say is uh, thank you to our financial support for this Invasive Insect Webinar Series. So this comes free to you through UMass Extension thanks to uh, some grant funding through the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and you can see uh, the grant number that we have listed on the screen below. Just thanking them uh, for allowing us to provide this quality education to you free of charge. All right, a couple of announcements for the folks that are joining us today in search of pesticide and association credits. Now, if you don't know what a pesticide or association credit is, don't worry about it. Um, we welcome everybody who's joining us today uh, and interested in these topics, but for our uh, professionals in the audience that are looking for these continuing education opportunities, all of the instructions for receiving pesticide credit, including the categories and applicators license listed on the screen, um, as well as the associations listed here will be shared at the very end of this webinar. So not just after our first presenter today, but after our second one. So you have to hang in there with us until uh, about noon today, and we will share these instructions at the end of the webinar. So you have to uh, watch and participate throughout this entire event this morning in order to receive these instructions. It is also very important that anyone who is looking for pesticide and association credit to answer all of the poll questions that will be shared with you today. Um, so we'll have three poll questions during each of the pre presenters talks and uh, we'll give you a little heads up that uh, we're starting one and you have to make sure that you answer those live because although they won't be graded, you don't receive a score on this, you do have to answer the poll question in order to receive your pesticide credits. Uh, if you sign off early or leave without answering the poll questions, unfortunately, we cannot award the credit for the continuing education to you. We do ask that everybody who is listening today participate in a brief voluntary and anonymous uh, survey. Um, this allows us to collect certain demographic information. Again, it's anonymous um, and completely voluntary uh, regarding gender, race, and ethnicity reporting uh, so we can fulfill our civil rights requirements as a recipient of federal funding uh, through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The link to fill that uh, survey out is in the chat and I believe has been just shared uh, right now. So what might be handy is if you can go into the chat, 
copy that link and paste it into your browser. You don't have to be doing that during the presentation this morning so you don't end up distracted, but put that in your browser so that as soon as uh, the uh, event closes today, you can fill that out for us afterwards. We do appreciate it. All right, that's, I think, all of the announcements that I have to share today. So what I will do is uh, introduce our first presentation and our first speaker. And again, uh, we, we thank all of you for joining us today. So let me see. Audrey, I am going to pass the screen share option over to you. Great. And it's my pleasure to introduce Audrey Barker Plotkin, a senior scientist and site and research manager at Harvard Forest. And she'll be speaking with us today about forest pest risk heating up with climate change. So uh, we're so excited to have you today, Audrey. Thank you, and please take it away. All right, thanks so much, Tani, and thank you for everyone for coming. I didn't know that invasive insects were of such broad interest. It's great to have so many people here. So I just wanna introduce myself and then I'm gonna turn off my webcam um, so that you can see the slides in a larger format. Um, so I'm, I've been working at the Harvard Forest that's in central Massachusetts. It's Harvard University's research forest. I've been there for almost 25 years and I'm really interested in how different you know, different stressors affect our trees and forests. I'm also associated with the University of Massachusetts. I'm a PhD candidate in Bethany Bradley's lab in the environmental conservation department. And a lot of the work that I'm gonna be drawing on is through a, the research management consortium that I'm part of um, at UMass called the Regional Invasive uh, species and climate change management network. So I'll be talking about more about that in a bit. So I'm going to turn off my webcam and yeah. So forest pest risk is heating up with climate change. Before I get into my talk, I want to acknowledge Harvard Forest and that um, Harvard Forest and UMass Amherst are located on unceded Nipmuc and Pecumtuck lands. I also want to acknowledge my collaborators on um, the project that I'll be talking about. So those authors include um, Meg Graham McLean, Cynthia Cheng, Elsa Cousins, Bianca Lopez, and Ayadele Ohuru. All right. So I'm going to start by very briefly introducing each stressor. Um, invasive insects are a major global change driver. One of the things about them as an ecologist that I find fascinating is that they can eliminate an entire tree species that really changes the system. So that's that's both interesting and rather terrifying. They're also I'm really interested in the long term effects on forest composition, productivity, cascading effects on biodiversity. So really thinking about, you know, my my stance is looking at the forest for the trees, I, I suppose. Um, and what else was I gonna say here? Um, that I'm a, I'm a forester. I know that many of you on this, on this call are you know, homeowners, um, landscapers, arborists. And um, so I'd, I'm not usually thinking about that at the tree level, but that perspective is also super important. And here I've got a few examples of three of my favorite um, in invasive insects and their hosts. So hemlock woolly adulged and hemlock, emerald ash borer and ash, and spongy moth, that's um, what gypsy moth is now called, and their preferred host in the eastern U.S. oaks. And I also want to point out that the Northeast U.S. is an invasion hotspot. There are imported forest pests in every state in the United States, but you can see that, you know, there are a lot about the density of them is higher in this um, 
in this northeastern region. And that's, you know, a conspiring mix of lots of global trade. So bringing in new, um, new insects along with lots of people to disperse them and lots of forests for them to eat. So I also want to just briefly say, you know, climate change, gosh, when I started, you know, working in this field, climate change was a little bit off in the future um, in terms of impacts, but it's really noticeable and happening now. So this is from the fourth national climate assessment, just some real basic um, basics that air temperature is increasing. And again, the Northeastern US is one of the hot spots, literally, with um, more than a degree and a half Fahrenheit of increasing um, annual temperature in 1986 to 2016 compared to 1901 to 1960. And that's especially noticeable in the winter. Climate change isn't just about warming temperatures. You know, what you see in the news, a lot of what's happening is changing patterns of precipitation. Overall, the Northeast is wetter than it used to be and is projected to become even more so over time. Oh, I'm going to go back. I just wanted to say that, um, and this is especially true um, in winter and spring precipitation. And I just wanted to point out, you know, it's a little confusing to think about how does drought fit into an overall wetting climate? You can see in the Western US, it is actually drying and warming. Here, even though we're getting uh, wetter, because it's also getting warmer, um, drought effects can occur because it's also about, you know, the warmer it is, the more wet it has to be to kind of stay just as moist. So we've got everything. We've got invasive insects, we've got climate change. How do they interact? What can we do about it? And that's where this um, organization comes in, the Northeast Risk Management Network. And what our mission is, is to reduce the compounding effects of invasive species and climate change by synthesizing relevant science, sharing the needs and knowledge of managers, building really strong scientist manager communities, and even doing some priority research. And this is a consortium of many organizations um, based in Massachusetts and uh, New York State. And it's really great to see that um, the Northeast Risk Management Network started in 2016. And in the last few years, there are new regional net, um, networks popping up across the United States. All right, poll question one. Thank you, Audrey. Excellent. So everyone, just another reminder, the poll question is now running. You should see a little blue box on your screen. And please uh, make sure that you are answering this question, especially if you need pesticide or association credits. However, we do invite everybody who is participating today to answer the poll questions. And we'll give a little bit of time to try to get this answered uh, before we move on. I can see that about 84% of folks have voted, so please get your answers in. Again, especially if you are looking for pesticide and association credits. I also want to add, if you're having difficulty finding where to answer the poll question because you're using a small device like a smartphone, you can also put your uh, answer into the chat or into the question box, sorry, and indicate which question you are answering. Perfect. Thank you, Ellen.
Okay, we'll give this about 10 more seconds for people to respond and then we'll close this poll. Okay, and you should be seeing the results of the what people answered. Audrey, can you see those? It looks like 3% responded Midwest, 89% Northeast, 4% Southeast, and 4% Pacific Northwest. Do you want to discuss those results? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I can't see the full results, but um, yes, the Northeast is is the right, is the correct answer. I mean, all, all of the United States, all of those regions have, you know, very, big challenges with invasive forest insects, but the Northeast wins in the numbers category. Lucky us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please continue. All right. Thanks. Okay. So, you know, I introduced the Northeast Risk Management Network, and one of the things that we do to synthesize science is put together these usually two-pager, what we call management challenges. And a couple of years, um, I led one on you know this very topic, and we thought about different ways that climate change interacts with forest pests. What pushes a tree towards death, and what actions we can take to keep trees out of that death spiral or pull them out of it. And so I'm going to structure my talk around this synthesis and really break down. I'm not going to go over it now. This is um, something that you can um, download later, um, but I'll, you know, I'll be breaking it down throughout the rest of the talk and use a few of our favorite insects to illustrate these ideas. But first, I'm going to introduce this concept of the forest death spiral, and it's I'm doing that because um, because tree death is a is a process, and because of that, because it's not just one thing that kills a tree, that's how climate change and invasive insects can really interact um, in different ways. So this um, this idea has been around for a while. This is from um, Mannion's 1991 book on tree disease concepts. So this you know this applies to insects as well as diseases. And really illustrating that there's kind of three levels that you know that you have to traverse before you get sucked into being a dead tree. Um, so first, kind of that first layer are predisposing factors that may, you know, a tree might be fine, but they you know predisposes them to further stress. And this is where things like climate change um, come in. And you know, this is especially relevant for trees to be growing outside of their climatically adapted range. With climate change, you know, trees sit around for a long time and they can look fine, but they may be, you know, the climate is changing around them within their lifespans, and they may be, they may be less um, adapted to where they started out. Kind of at the next level are what Mannion called inciting factors. And those are, you know, kind of those marquee events where, you know, you start hearing about it among your professional networks or on the news. This is where outbreaks of defooling insects um, or drought might come in. However, it's not even those things that are usually the, you know, the most proximal cause of death. And I'll just point out, um, for example, one of the systems that I look at are, is what causes oak mortality in response to spongy moth outbreaks. And yeah, that certainly is the major cause, but it's sometimes these wooden bark boring insects that do them in, for example, in the last spongy moth outbreak, two-line chestnut borer, usually an innocuous native pest, was you know found in a lot of the trees, the oaks that actually died from that outbreak. And so you really need to put all of that together um, to end up with a tree, you know, with a dead tree. That's both kind of fascinating, a little terrifying, but a little bit hopeful because it means that you know. 
it's not a done deal to have a stress tree. You can, you can improve, you know, if its conditions improve, it can get out of that death spiral. And that's what we tried to illustrate in this management challenge. We took the kind of, you know, original, um, fairly complicated figure and tried to make it a much simpler conceptual idea of, you know, that there are both on ramps to the death spiral, but there are also off ramps um, that management actions can help trees get out. All right, and so we, when we thought about different ways that climate and invasive insects interact, we came up with four kind of major ways. One is that climate change can bring a pest into a new area. Another way is that, for example, warming climate can result in a minor pest that's you know, already there becoming virulent with climate change. Maybe they have you know, lots more life cycles per year. A third way is that climate stress can make trees more vulnerable to pest outbreaks. So you know, maybe a, a defoliator that wouldn't usually be a big deal, conspiring with drought can add up to death. And then finally, climate change, you know, you've got these trees growing. When you have a disturbance, say, you know, there's a pest that does end up killing a bunch of trees, the trajectory of forest recovery is going to be different because of climate change. So I'll go through examples of each of those. So I'm going to start, um, but before I get into that, I'll go into these, um, these actions a little bit more uh, later in the talk, but I just want to, you know, give the overall framework of what can we do? And we organize these in terms of resistance, resilience, and transition. And that's a uh, lingo that is um, used a lot in climate adaptation work. And that's really embracing a suite of options that are often described as you know, resistance, which is you know, all about preventing change, resilience, and that's promoting the ability for a tree or system to recover or bounce back after an adverse event. And then finally, we need to accept that things are going to change. We can't prevent change from happening. And so transition is all about promoting change in a positive direction. And then finally, um, we added prevention, which, you know, is really important, especially when we're thinking about invasive insects, you know, thinking about how can we prevent new introductions? How can we slow the spread of um, existing insects? Okay, so my first example is one where climate change is bringing a pest to a new area. And this is one of my favorite ones, hemlock woolly adelgid. So this map is showing um, the distribution of hemlock is in the green. Overlaid on that is the um, where hemlock woolly adelgid is occurring with the yellow counties um, lit up. Those are places where there were new hemlock woolly adelgid um, detections in 2021. So, you know, it's, it's all through southern New England and southern New York, and it's starting to get up into well into Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, even the Adirondacks. Um, and it's a really interesting story and in that a lot of that is the limitation on hemlock woolly adelgid are cold winter temperatures. They can kill the overwintering hemlock woolly adelgid. But there are two things that are changing. One is that, you know, more temperatures are warming, especially in the winter. We're getting fewer of those really cold nights. The other is that hemlock woolly adelgid has great adaptation potential. Um, one kind of nerdy fact about hemlock woolly adelgid is that it reproduces asexually. So you would think, well, if it's not reproducing sexually and having, you know, that additional gene mixing, 
maybe its adaptive capacity is limited. Maybe that's true, but it doesn't seem to be limiting its ability to adapt to colder temperatures. There was a cool study done from Joe Elkington's lab a few years ago where they super cooled adelgids from southern parts of its, um, you know, southern areas as well as more northern areas. And they found that the more northern populations definitely had more cold tolerance than the southern ones. And that's evidence that the adelgid is adapting quickly. When you think about it, they have, you know, two full life cycles per year. So that's, you know, that's a lot of chances to select for those cold adapted ones. Now, that sounds pretty bad, and it is, but hemlock decline from adelgid is likely to be slower in the northern parts of hemlock's range, but it will, I think, eventually occupy the full range of hemlock. This is from, uh, these maps are from another study by Thomas McAvoy up in Vermont, and really looking at um, different periods of time and predicted um, overwinter mortality of hemlock woolly adelgid from cold. And so this is saying, you know, if we focus in on the, on the Northeast, um, you know, we're already getting different shades of blue. And by the end of this uh, century, the far, the bottom right panel, you can see that, yeah, uh, Southern New England is really gonna be great conditions from hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, less than half cold mortality predicted. And even in the Northern areas, you know, going from the kind of the dark blue to light blue or turquoise, that's an increase in winter survival from, you know, say 10% to 20%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but given how rapidly um, adults reproduce, that, you know, that adds up to a lot. That can make a big difference. All right, so gosh, what can we do? First of all, you know, we used to say, don't worry, Northern New England, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid will just be killed by cold winter, winter temperatures. We can't rely on that anymore, so we need to get prepared. So we need to really take seriously um, not moving potentially infested materials, including respecting the quarantines in some states, including Vermont and Maine. And here's a cool tip for people who are homeowners and, you know, like to put out bird feeders keep those bird feeders far from hemlock trees, especially during the spring and summer when the adelgid is mobile. And what I mean by mobile is crawling around a little bit. Um, the adults are immobile and they don't, you know, so adelgids don't disperse well on their own volition. However, there's lots of them and they're little and birds offer easy and convenient transportation. So um, that's one thing that even a homeowner can do. And then as hemlock woolly adelgid moves into new areas, you know, I think about the forest scale and I think, well, treating whole stands of hemlock, that's, that's a tall order. You know, I'm keeping a hopeful eye on biological control work um, that's happening. Um, there's some cool work happening at Cornell currently. Um, but, you know, if you're a landscaper or arborist or homeowner, it is entirely possible to do effective um, treatments of individual trees or special groves. And that can be an important way to have little pockets of survival. And, you know, a lot of, you know, we're trying to outweigh this pest in some ways, looking for, as we develop, you know, possibly effective treatments. So any, you know, little, little bits of trees that we can save are meaningful and you know could be the seeds of of future resilience um i'm going to spend most most of my time talking about this warming climates bringing new pests in because i had just a couple of really great examples about that the second example i'm going to talk about is a little bit different it's not your classic invasive insect because it is a native insect, but not to northern, you know, not to the northeast. 
Um, this is Southern Pine Beetle, a well-known pesky villain in the Southern US. And its hosts are a variety of pines, especially hard pines. Now, but with warming temperatures, this, um, this insect is moving into the Northeast. It's causing a lot of problems on Long Island and is, you know, has infested trees in Connecticut. I think the last report I saw was as of 2021, Southern pine beetles had been cat captured in traps in Massachusetts and even up to Southern Maine. Um, but so far, we haven't seen any outbreaks, you know, any infestations of trees in those areas. But here's what's predicted. So this, this map is um, from a cool paper from a few years ago from Lesk and others. And the first thing I want to have you look at are the lines on the map with the with the years with the numbers on them. So these are predicted years when southern pine beetle will, you know, happily exist. And so, you know, we're past 2020 already. Um, and yep, we're finding southern pine beetles in traps up to southern Maine. Yep, it's right on target. Um, and by 2080, you know, we're really going to see, you know, the prediction is that southern pine beetle is going to make it pretty much, you know, up, up through almost all of Maine, um, all of the upper Midwest and into Canada. And that's really important because the other part of the map shows the ranges of different major pine species. So in the pink color is pitch pine, green is red pine, and blue is that classic boreal pine, jack pine, um, which also there's there's a little bit of jack pine and coastal Maine, which is just kind of cool. Um, and a lot of the work that I've looked at so far has been looking at you know the risk that southern pine beetle poses to this globally rare pitch pine barren ecosystem. And so the photo on the on the right in this slide shows that you know a, a healthy pitch pine barren is a pretty low density forest, but a lot of the pitch pine forests, you know, current condition are very dense and mixed with hardwoods. And that becomes important because um, lowering the tree density. Um, in pine stands can reduce the outbreak risk of southern pine beetle because southern pine beetles are tiny. So the left hand photo shows a couple of the little black dots on the blob are, are a couple of southern pine beetles um, embedded in some resin. And that's this defense response that the, that the pines um, mount they use the resin ducts and create a lot of pitch and they pitch out, literally pitch out the southern pine beetles. However, when trees are dense, um, the, the southern pine beetles have this amazing um, pheromone response where they put out chemical signals and draw in lots of southern pine beetles. And especially when there's high tree density, those southern pine beetle populations can build up very rapidly because they have multiple generations per year and overwhelm even healthy trees and overwhelm this pitch defense. So, especially in the context of these pitch pine barrens, you know, we're really concerned about southern pine beetle exacerbating the conversion of these pine barrens to hardwood dominated communities. Um, but the good news is that really focusing on um, restoring pitch pine barrens by thinning and prescribed fire, so lowering the density of the pines, can reduce susceptibility to southern pine beetle by increasing tree vigor and reducing that tree density. Okay, now we're ready for the second poll question. So everyone should see the poll question on their screen. And there's more than one right answer to this question. Oh, 
And again, if you're having trouble answering it on your device, you can always put the answer into the question box. And we'll give this about 10 more seconds before we close it. Okay, so the poll is closed. And I'll tell you the answers um, for the speaker. 85% uh, said red pine, 83% said jack pine, and 92% pitch pine. Do you want to tell any more about the answers to the poll? Yes. Um, yeah, so I, it's all of the above. Yes. So all of those answers are correct. All right. Oh, and one thing I, just before I move on, I just, um, one thing that I don't know is whether white pine is really vulnerable to southern pine beetle. There's people have observed southern pine beetle on a white you know, on white pine, um, but it's not clear whether it can affect white pine forests. And to me, that you know, I've got my fingers crossed that they won't, because white pine is a real major species in in our ecosystem. So that's something that keeps me up a little bit, not knowing that. Okay, so I'm going to move on. There we go. So another way that climate change and invasive insects can interact is by warming temperatures and maybe drought, um, prompting a a pest that's pretty minor to become virulent with climate change. And the example here I'll, I'll use are scale insects, which damage trees by eating their sap. They survive and re reproduce more in warm environments. And the examples that I'll show are hemlock, um, elongate hemlock scale, which is an invasive scale insect that, that um, has hemlock as a host, and then also a native scale that is south of us uh, called gloomy scale, which I think is just kind of the best name ever. And that's especially problematic on um, red pine, sorry, red maples in urban areas. Um, and that's really interesting in that usually, you know, usually the scale insects aren't, you know, they're kind of a minor pest, but what uh, some researchers there, Frank and Just, found was that in urban areas, these um, gloomy scale populations can build up to damaging levels on red maples, especially in hot, dry urban areas. Want to give a little aside about elongate hemlock scale um, and that it might not be all bad um, whether the scale, you know, it certainly sucks sap. It's less damaging than hemlock woolly adulgid. We know that. And there's some evidence that the scale and the adulgid compete with one another. So there's at least one study that showed that um, new foliage growth was, you know, the highest on uninfested hemlock. So that's the yellow bar in the right-hand panel. Um, pretty similar in when there was only elongate hemlock scale. But in, interestingly, the you know, suppressed growth was the worst when there was just adulgid, that's the maroon bar, compared to the pink bar, which shows trees that had both adulgid and scale. And the researchers think that's maybe because the scale and adulgid are competing. And so if there's more scale, there's less adulgid and less overall damage. So I'm not saying that scale is good, but it might not be all bad. So really, um, 
you know, increasing vigor of stands is or, or individual trees is important. I'll point out that gloomy scale is not yet in New England, but it may become a problem, especially in urban areas with warming temperatures, those urban heat islands. And that's certainly where gloomy scale is a problem um, in, the sub, in the southeast. And one thing to point out for um, working with scale infestations is that for landscape trees, make sure that the trees get adequate water, but don't use extra nitrogen fertilizer. Excess nitrogen fertilizer makes scale insects just go completely nuts. So a third way that climate uh, climate change and invasive insects can interact is that climate stress can make trees more vulnerable to pest outbreaks. And the example of gears used here are oaks with spongy moth and drought. So spongy moths defoliate several tree species, but they preferentially feed on oaks in our area. And if you are from this, this region, you may remember um, a few years ago, there was a big spongy moth outbreak. And one of the things that prompted that was that there were drought conditions um, in the year, the kind of the first years of that outbreak. And it's a really interesting story because there's kind of two ways that drought exacerbated the effects of spongy moth. One was by directly stressing the, the host, the oak trees, so making um, mortality more likely. But the other way was indirectly through a fungal control of the spongy moth. So the big picture, uh, the big photo in this slide is showing a spongy moth caterpillar that, that's been killed by Entomophaga mimiga. This is an introduced fungus that became established in our region in 1989. And since then, it's really kept the spongy moth um, populations in check. One of the great, one, one of the nice things about Entomophaga mimiga compared to some other things like uh, viruses that, that can stop outbreaks of spongy moth is that this fungus is, um, keeps populations in check even at low population densities. And that's important because that can prevent an outbreak from happening. So that's really great. And we've been kind of, you know, had 25 or more years of happiness with this, um, with this fungus established in our region and really keeping outbreaks from happening. However, fungi need a lot of moisture to do well. And we had a couple of dry springs, 2015 and 2016, and that suppressed the, fun the fungal populations, which in turn released the spongy moth populations. So that's, that's one way where drought stress um, is interacting with, with the insect. And I also just want to point out, you know, I always thought, gosh, oaks grow well in dry conditions. They should be fine with drought. And to, to a certain extent, that is true. Oaks grow well in dry conditions. And when there are, when there's a drought, they keep growing. They, they, don't, they don't slow down their growth. And that's great to a point, but it's a bit of a risky strategy. Other trees that are more conservative shut down, um, you know, shut down their water system. Um, oaks don't, and that makes them at risk of mortality from hydraulic failure. So they're basically their, you know, their water conducting pipes break down. And there's, um, this is an interesting bioscience article that, that goes over that. So what can we do to make oak forests more resilient to drought and spongy moth? Well, the Forest Stewards Guild has, um, has a recent project on um, Assessing oak forest resiliency, there's some really great tools and um, guidelines that you can look up here. 
And one simple way is, especially at a forest scale, is to increase oak vigor by thinning forests, so reducing the, comp the competition within the forest. So my last example is one where, you know, I could talk about emerald ash borer and ash in a variety of ways, but I'm going to focus on the effects of emerald ash borer in black ash, we call it brown ash around here, uh, wetlands. And it's a really interesting example. Most of the work on this has been in the upper Midwest, but I think it probably applies to brown ash wetlands in, say, Maine as well. <clears throat> so emerald ash borer has been in the Midwest for a lot longer than it has been here, um, but it's certainly in the Northeast. And one thing that can happen is that when emerald ash borer or um, preemptive harvesting by, by us humans, um, when you take out the black ash, it raises the water table because trees pump tons of water. Um, and by making that wetland wetter without the trees, it can sometimes shift entirely to a non-forest system. So that's a big change. And one of the things that we can do to respond to that is to plant, you know, to plant trees or do silviculture do forest management that, that promotes tree regeneration and prevents that switch from a forested, uh, forested wetland to a non-forested wetland. And then thinking a bit more, so you know, that's really thinking about transition um, when ash is gone. In our region, white ash is often a fairly minor component of the forest, um, but it's a really important tree. So when we're thinking about upland ash, one is, you know, there are some things that you can do to keep your options open, kind of have some bed hedging. Um, if you have a forest and are want to do some management, that's great. In this case, you'd want to create some larger openings, maybe bigger than a quarter of an acre. And that's because emerald ash borer doesn't attack seedlings or small ash trees. But to get that regeneration, you need to have some bigger openings because the ash seedlings need a lot of light. At the end, while you're doing that, you also want to retain large, healthy ash trees, especially female trees. And I'll just give a, a little aside that um, it's kind of, first of all, having male and female trees is not the, is not the, most, not the most common uh, strategy. A lot of trees have um, their flowers are, are both male and female, or at least they have male and female flowers on the same tree, but not ash. They've got male and female trees. And last summer I learned how to tell them apart. I'll tell you that telling their, them apart by their flowers is really, really hard. But if you wait till midsummer to late summer, if there's a seed crop, then it's pretty easy. Just bring out your binoculars and the trees that have the seeds, or if you're standing under a tree and there's, there's a carpet of seeds, then you found your female tree. And that's important because there are far fewer female ash trees than male ash trees. So you want to retain those uh, potential seed bearing trees to hedge your bets. And then you think, yeah, but it's probably going to die anyway. And yes, that that is likely to happen. Maybe there's some resistance, maybe there, you know, maybe not this tree. But that's still okay because standing dead trees are still really valuable in a forest. They're great habitat for birds, insects, and other wildlife. And if you want to find out more, again, the Forest Guild, um, Forest Stewards Guild, came out with a nice, simple 10 recommendations for managing ash in the face of emerald ash borer and climate change. And the Risk Network also hosted a really great webinar on the topic a couple of years ago. 
Okay, last poll question. So the poll has been launched. You should be seeing it on your screen. And we'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer the question. It's a true false. And the poll is closed. And 31% answered true and 69% answered false. Yeah, so that one is Fall. So a, a wet spring would be great conditions for the Entomophaga mimaga fungus, um, which would um, keep those spongy moth populations in check. And also, you know, even though oaks do fine in, in drier places, they do like moisture. Um, so that wet spring would be less likely for an outbreak. All right. So I just want to wrap up by spending a little bit um, of, of time going over you know, what can we do more generally. So starting with prevention, um, you know, we want to slow the spread. Um, there, there are don't move firewood campaigns that are that are useful. Um, and then supporting policies that reduce introductions of novel pests. So one resource that I'll highlight here is that the Cary Institute in Eastern New York has this great program called Tree Smart Trade, which is really promoting policy actions that will prevent new forest pests. So a lot of um, new invasive insects are boring uh, wood borers and come in on wood pallets through shipping. So one thing that we can advocate for is switching to pest-free packaging materials for international shipments. You know, doing more for early detection and rapid response, you know, supporting programs like the federal APHIS program, and thinking about, um, you know, importation of live plants. These are all things that, you know, clearly these aren't things that you're going to do at your at your home or as individuals, but they are things that, that the, those are policies you can advocate for. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Thanks. In terms of resistance. You know, when, when you do detect a small population of a pest, their eradication can be possible and useful. Um, I know that a lot of you here are here for your, um, in part because you are maintaining your pesticide applicator licenses. And that's a really important role where you can treat individual trees or special groves. And to find out more, I'll just, um, show you a resource right in UMass Extension. There's a lot of great fact sheets on different uh, stressors, including invasive insects, and that includes uh, treatment information. For resilience, um, this is something at a forest scale. You can work with your forester to increase stand vigor and diversity. You can do some thinning, you can create you know, larger gaps like I was talking about with the ash to, to allow for sun-loving tree species to establish to increase that diversity. 
Um, and you can also, you know, be prepared. For example, the National Phonology Network has this cool um, forecasting program for that are based on phonology. So that's the timing of of events in in living systems, and that can be important because if you put in some of these forecasts, use weather inputs and then give you a sense of, you know, depending on where you are, when to expect, for example, spongy moth egg masses to hatch. So you can keep an eye out for them. And then finally, transitions. Sometimes mortality will be widespread. And when that happens, you can consider managing a forest for a warmer future. The Forest Service has a climate change tree atlas and you can think about promoting climate resilient species. And I'll also emphasize that, you know, in the forest situation, certainly you're going to want to remove hazard trees near trails and your house and things like that. But salvage harvesting isn't always necessary because dead and dying trees are important and actually a really um, a component of our second growth forest landscape that's really lacking. We have a dearth of dead stuff in the forest, which fills really important ecological roles for habitat and biodiversity. And just a little more about um, looking for war, you know, climate adapted species. Um, there's the tree atlas. This publication has a nice um, kind of simplified table of trees that already grow in southern and northern New England and whether they're expected to do about the same or do worse or do better with projected climate changes. So we can think about, you know, uh, managing for or in your in your landscape planting some of these species that are projected to do well and maybe even experiment with oops um, even experiment with you know species that we have here but aren't very common like yellow birch. Yards and managed landscapes are great places to try new species and, you know, test out what's going to work in the future. All right, so finally, um, I'll just end with an invitation to get more involved with the Northeast Risk Management Network. Our website, we have a website with a lot of amazing resources. We also have a listserv where we send out um, a kind of a research summary every other week. So we don't spam your, your inbox, but hopefully send out, you know, periodic really useful information. And if you are interested, um, the Risk um, Management Network has our annual symposium coming up in just a few weeks, February 14th to 15th. It's uh, two half days on Zoom and you can register for that and we'd love to have you. All right, so with that, I'll just say thanks very much and happy to answer questions. Excellent, Audrey. Thank you so very much. Oh my goodness, so many questions. So I will do my best to get through <laughs> as many as I can, which I'll, I'll read them to you. We have a lot in the queue already, and then I see folks are, <laughs> thank you folks, adding more. Um, I just want to say that we will try to um, honor the break and at least stop our questions Oh my goodness, by 1015, yes, certainly. So we can take a break um, until 1030 before our next speaker. So first question, let me get moving. Um, this is from Craig. Oh, um, this is uh, something that I've sort of answered a few folks about. He's asking, would it be possible to have a PDF copy of your presentation for his tree library. And we've had a couple folks ask about handouts. Um, my response, Audrey, has been if for both you and Elizabeth, we have permission, we do have a website that we can share some handouts on and that I have already put in the chat for everybody um, that a recording of today's presentations will be available on our website in the near future as well. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. Yes, um, I, yeah, I'd be happy for you to share share the slides, and I can try like during the break, 
maybe I can stick in the chat some of the links that I had in the slides. Yes, that would be great. We're also trying to share links in the chat, but if you have some you can load into there, that, that would be great. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, this one has quite a few parts, so let me know if I need to <laughs> repeat anything. This is from Anya. What about changing composition of invasive understory and vining plants in a forest as a factor? Shifting food sources through invasive monoculture for native insects that otherwise may help keep pressures in check, biodiversity diminishing overall, affecting the health of the whole complex system. And there's another part to it, but want to start with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I didn't have a chance to get into any of those, but those are all really important considerations. Um, a lot of the work that the that the Northeast Risk Network does is really focused on invasive terrestrial plants. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that, for example, when you do have mortality from an invasive insect, when you, you know, when there is a disturbance and create an opening, that's a real opportunity for invasive plants to become established and something that really needs to be part of any forest management plan where you're creating openings or managing in, you know, mortality. Um, yeah, certainly decreasing biodiversity is, is a problem, you know, is a problem that is being you know, caused by many global change factors. And that is where invasive forest insects are particularly a, a large concern because they can eliminate entire, you know, functionally eliminate entire species. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's, you know, follow up to that, but those, yes, those are, those are big concerns and things that I think about a lot. Great, thank you. Yes, let me get back to the other part of the question. She added, are there native predators to these pests that we can encourage a presence of? Um, and she's saying they won't have bioevolved for non-native insects, but can we help the system defense by encouraging presence of specific predators? Let's see. Um, yes, so I, I I could say a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, there are native predators. Often they aren't effective at preventing, you know, high levels or outbreaks because these insects are novel. Um, and that's where biocontrol, developing effective biocontrols, you know, you really need to be super careful and because those are often introduced as well. For example, the Entomophaga mymiga fungus, um, fortunately, is specific to spongy moth, but you need to be really careful when you're developing biocontrols to make sure that anything you introduce won't also affect native um, fauna. Actually, that said, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say that's great that you brought that up because that yeah. partially answers another question um let me see uh from mead i don't want to interrupt but mead said what is the role of biological control organisms in controlling invasive pests how do we balance safeguarding our native species example oaks and ash and importing new biological control agents which may come with their own ecological ramifications to reduce <laughs> existing pest loads so you started to speak to that and i'll let yep. you add add more, but I also have two cents on, on some things too, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll say something and then I would love to hear your two cents, Connie. Um, let's see, so yeah, I think that um, the protocols in place for developing biological controls are, you know, take into account um, screening for, you know, trying to anticipate those unintended consequences um, but certainly, you know, in the story of spongy moth in the early 1900s, just a whole suite of potential biocontrols were brought over and just kind of thrown out there. Um, and there's evidence that, you know, they've really, that some of those have really decimated, um, you know, native, beautiful moth, you know, moth populations 
Um, so that, you know, that's a good warning story. Um, I think that the protocols to make sure that biocontrols that are brought in really are specific to the target pest have improved a lot, but you know, it's still it's still a calculated risk. Um, and uh, before I turn it to you, Tani, just to address a little bit of Anya's question of um, are there native things? You know, certainly another piece of the spongy moss story is that white-footed mouse are a big um, biological control. They eat lots of spongy moth, especially their pupae. They like those a lot. Um, and so they are an important control on those populations. But if the spongy moth starts kind of going into outbreak mode, the mice can't keep up. Excellent. All right, Tani, what, what are your two cents on biocontrol? Excellent examples. I know you overlapped with them and shared them very well. Um, just to add that um, certainly the, the process, like you said, for introducing non-native insects to help fight <laughs> non-native insects. So uh, introducing biological control has changed a lot, as you mentioned. Uh, even from the early 1900s, and that it takes uh, years, if not decades, sometimes to get approval, and that scientists test a lot of these organisms, or, or well, you know, all of the biocontrol for emerald ash borer, for example, was tested in a quarantine facility before it could be released to make sure that it had no, um, I think, unreasonable or undue adverse risk towards our native bupressed beetles. So I think you answered that that quite well, but it's a question that comes up a lot. Um, all right, I don't want to, I could add so much more too, because this is fascinating, <laughs> but let's give it to you more questions uh, from Glenn. Oh, um, if the hemlock range doesn't cover Florida, why is there data on HWA mortality for Florida? <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that too. I thought about cropping the map. Um, you know, I think be, because when you're looking at kind of climate predictions of where of where um, insects can be, um, it's really the climate data that go in. And so that covers the whole US. So just, yeah, could have cropped that out. If I was writing the paper, maybe I would have done that. But um, you can just ignore that part. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, I believe from Caro. I thought that woolly adelgids were also able to withstand colder temperatures well. Um, well, maybe you're thinking of something specific, but let me let me say that yeah, adelgids can do okay down to you know like minus thirty, um, and there is. You know, but it does, colder temperatures do kill adulgids over winter. It's just a matter of how many of them survive. And the ones that do survive probably are more cold tolerant. So you're sort of, you know, have this very strong selection pressure to build up colder tolerant populations over time. The other piece of it is that the, how the adulgids get cold is important. Um, if you have kind of gradually gradually decreasing temperatures over over time, then adulgids can tolerate colder temperatures. It's really those cold snaps where you have you know fairly warm weather and then a plunge in temperature that can um, that's the most you know does the best job of killing adulgids. Thank you. All right, let's see another question from Scott. Um, does the change in climate um, affect the frequency with which hemlock woolly adelgid can reproduce? Um, I, we haven't seen that um, in our region. The hemlock woolly adelgid goes through two life cycles per year. However, one of the reasons, so when hemlock woolly adelgid was introduced in Virginia um, and because of sort of prevailing winds and stuff, um, mostly you know, came farther north. But then, gosh, was it you know 15 or 20 years ago when the adelgid finally hit the Appalachians and kind of more southern areas, 
one of the reasons it decimated those forests much more quickly is that it's warmer there and the adelgids have three life cycles per year. So I I don't know. I haven't heard of that of of any additional life cycles per year in our region, but it maybe isn't impossible. This is where my entomo you know, I'm not an entomologist, so my knowledge is stopping right there. Thank you. Let's see another question uh, from Priscilla back to the biocontrol topic. Um, asking about specific biocontrols that have been released for hemlock woolly adelgid and um, if you have any information on their current status. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't think about them as, you know, very intensively, but the one thing I can, you know, kind of give an update is that there's some really interesting work so, so far, no single biocontrol that's been tried has really been effective at um, reducing adelgid populations enough to make a difference for the hemlocks. There is current work out of Cornell that is looking at combining two different biocontrol agents that um, work at different, different life stages of the adelgid um, and, you know, that is current work. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's but it's a really interesting idea and you know increases our chances. Thank you. Let's see another question here. Um, oh, there were a couple from Laura and Adrian um, relating to birds. So, what is the pathway or mechanism of birds transporting hemlock woolly adelgid into a new area? Could you explain that further? and just uh, explaining the reason for keeping bird feeders away from hemlocks, just would you mind repeating that? Yeah, sure. So hemlock woolly adults are really tiny. They're like the size of poppy seeds. And then they're also kind of embedded um, for a lot of their lives in this kind of woolly stuff. That's why they're called woolly adults. That's kind of waxy. So they stick to birds' feet, basically. So when a bird perches on a hemlock tree that has adelgid, some of those adelgids attach to the bird's feet, and then they can fly to a new area. And when they perch, you know, say on another hemlock, the adelgids can, you know, pop off. So that's, that's the rationale. So keeping your bird feeders farther from hemlock trees would reduce the chance that birds would be perching on potentially infested hemlock trees. Thank you. Oh my goodness, so many excellent questions and we're not going to make it. Um, we have a couple more minutes, I'll ask. Um, uh, Skyler asks, is there a model for hemlock woolly adelgid and its northern movement like there is for southern pine beetle? That you know um, of? Maybe not exact. Yeah, there's definitely um, predictions similar similar to southern pine beetle that people have worked on. the The maps that I showed, the color kind of color coded maps that I showed, was one way of looking at you know predicted change over time of adelgid mortality. So that it's a little more getting at not so much will adelgid be somewhere or not but if it's there how how likely is it to survive the winter so yeah there is work that kind of gets at that thank you um questions here i am a huge advocate of leaving tree snags for wildlife i am recently wondering if doing so is helping to harbor invasive pests so they can continue to spread um uh, as it is possible that wildlife is not eating all of them what are your thoughts on this hmm well you know if the tree is is already dead then you're not going to be having that invasive insect persisting once once it has died there is an argument for um in some for some cases southern pine beetle is one where we're do, you know cutting kind of a barrier of infested trees to protect uninfested areas is a strategy that can work um but for individual trees that you know 
are dead because they were infested, leaving them once they're dead is, is not going to really make a difference. Thank you. And I wanted to add, we have a forester from Mass DCR that's listening. And um, with regard to Southern pine beetle, um, it has been trapped in Massachusetts in various areas, but has only um, as of this past growing season been found infesting trees uh, by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, I believe in, in the Mashpee area. So um, I think silvicultural techniques to manage southern pine beetle for folks that are doing forest management um, uh, might not be <laughs> uh, quite necessary yet, but really I, I'm not sure how far in advance you have to plan for that. So maybe that's something to speak to as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the update on on where Southern Pine Beetle is found. Matt, yeah, that sounds that sounds right to be in Mashpee. Yeah, it's certainly not in Massachusetts very much. The kind of the rest, of, you know, if you're thinking about um, this globally rare pitch pine ecosystem, um, you know, getting ahead of the Southern Pine Beetle and doing you know, density reduction treatments to, as that are part of kind of an overall, if restoration of pitch pine barrens is a goal for your land, then, you know, I would say go ahead and do that now before Southern Pine Beetle shows up. Thank you. Oh my goodness. All right. So we're one minute over into our break. So I do want to honor the, the break here. There are so many great questions remaining. I can do my best to maybe pass those along to, to Audrey or answer some during the break now, but I just want to thank our audience for being so engaged and, and asking so many great questions. And thank you, Audrey, for a fantastic presentation. Yeah, thanks, thanks Tony, and thanks to all of you for your good questions. And yeah, um, if you want to shoot any of those to me in the chat, Tony, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, excellent. All right, so just a reminder, um, I'm going to change the, the screen in a moment here, but we'll have a break until 1030 to allow us to get uh, set up and ready with our next speaker, but I also encourage everybody to uh, take a break as well and just make sure you're back to your device uh, to get started right at 1030. Thank you. Great. All right, and let me look. We have about a minute. Um, so, oh, it just switched to ten thirty. <laughs> so, ho hopefully, everybody is back from the break. And I do want to honor our time here and get uh, started right away. So we have plenty of time for all of the fantastic questions. Um, let's see here. So we have with us. Dr. Elizabeth Barnes, the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator with the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, talking to us about spotted lanternfly updates for Massachusetts. So uh, Elizabeth, do you wanna just get started? Yes, sounds good to me. Um, so today I'm gonna be walking you through some background information about spotted lanternfly biology, and then getting into things like where it is, what the management recommendations are, and what you can do right now to kind of prepare for this insect. So to start with, I wanna give just a general overview of spotted lanternfly and then move into some more specific details about some of these, uh, uh, some of these bullet points. So spotted lanternfly is an invasive sap sucking insect. They are um, true bugs, which means that even though they look an awful lot like a butterfly or a moth, they are in fact more closely related to things like cicadas and plant hoppers. They feed on over a hundred different species of plants, including things like tree of heaven, grape, black walnut, maple, and rose. Um, and interestingly, they are not actually a major pest in their host range. There's an occasional small scale outbreak of them, but for the most part, they're not a big issue there. Uh, in contrast, <laughs> after they were introduced here into the US on some imported stone in around 2014 in Pennsylvania, um, 
they initially were at fairly low levels and we thought, you know, maybe they're not going to be a big problem here. But then we saw a major spike a few years ago. And since then, we've seen a lot of really high numbers of lanternfly and they've just continued spreading. Uh, they are also invasive in a couple other places, including Korea and Japan. Um, and there's some things that we were able to learn about them from um, uh, about dealing with lanternfly from the experiences that they had there with them. Um, but there's actually been some differences in North America, which kind of illustrates how difficult it is to figure out how to deal with a new invasive species because it never seems to behave quite the same way uh, in each different area. Which leads me to my final point, which is that there's still a lot we need to learn about these insects. Um, I am giving you the most up-to-date information that we have at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we're not gonna learn something new in the next, you know, say six months. Um, there's a slide in this talk that I wouldn't have had if I had been giving it last year. So what I really suggest is, you know, learn what you can right now, but when you get to a point where you have to actually deal with lanternfly yourself, either, you know, do some research on your own or feel free to reach out to us to ask any questions that you might have. We're always happy to help to, you know, to the best of our ability. All right, let's get into the biology now. Spotted lanternfly first hatch out as these pretty small little um, black insects with white spots on them. They continue to look the same and just continue to grow um, from around May until July. And then in July to September, they reach their fourth instar, which is very different. It's red with black spots and white spots on it. Um, then uh, from July to December, they reach the adult stage, which a lot of you are probably more familiar with. It's got these um, uh, big flashy wings with the beautiful colors on them. Um, so that's probably what you're more used to seeing. Then in September, usually around mid-September uh, through until the first hard frost, they lay their eggs, um, and then those eggs overwinter. Now, um, they will keep laying eggs up until um, that hard frost, so it's really anywhere from, you know, uh, early October, if it's a very cold year, all the way up through late December, if it's a warm year. It's just, there's going to be a lot of variability there, depending on the temperature. Spotted lanternfly um, are sap-sucking insects. They feed with this straw-like mouth part that they stick into the bark of plants and then drink the sap out of it. They're kind of like a little tree vampire in a way. Um, when they actually stick their mouth into the tree, it does a little bit of physical damage to the tree, but most of the issues actually come from just the volume of sap that they're drinking from the tree and not that physical damage from that initial um, uh, insertion of their mouth. Now, as I mentioned before, they have a really wide host range. I've just got a few examples of photos of plants that they're known to feed on in the background here, but there are over a hundred of them. Um, that said, they do definitely have preferences for certain plants that they're gonna go to before others. Um, and many of the uh, host plants on this list are things that they can sort of feed to tide them over until they can find one of their better host plants. These are the hosts that they seem to particularly like in Pennsylvania. Um, this is kind of what we're going on for the moment for what we're expecting in Massachusetts, but it may be a little bit different here because our forests just have a, a different composition than they have uh, down there. Now, you'll notice that they're switching their hosts over the course of the season. Earlier in the season, they tend to focus on plants that have thinner bark, They'll also go for the new growth on plants. So like on grapes earlier in the season around May to June, if you see them, they're gonna be on those, those new bits of growth of the grape rather than the, the bulk of the vine itself. Then later in the summer, um, they move on to bigger trees with thicker bark, but which also have more sap in them. So there's a greater volume of food for them to be drinking. Uh, notice as well that they will feed on grape and tree of heaven throughout the summer. Those are their two favorite host plants and you can find them on there at just about um, any time during the growing season. Uh, with the, a little bit of an exception that Tree of Heaven, they tend to move away from really late in the year um, just because 
the the tree of heaven the um, sap isn't flowing as much as it is on some other plants at that point now what do they actually do that to the trees it's going to vary a lot depending on how many lantern fly you have on a plant and also uh, the the type of plant you're looking at um, if you only have a couple lantern fly on a tree not going to cause a lot of damage those trees are going to be fine unfortunately we tend to see lantern fly in these outbreak numbers where it's not just one or two lantern fly it's you know a hundred lantern fly on a single plant and that can cause some some damage to some plants uh, most plants however it's going to have a fairly minor impact if the plant is healthy they are causing uh, an additional stress to the plant which means that it's fine on its own and actually we heard about this a little bit earlier um, if it's just that one single um, uh, stress on the plant not going to be a big deal but when you combine it with other things like disease drought construction uh, other insects and multiple years of heavy feeding that's when you start to see issues like you can get branch dieback um, and more serious issues for those plants there are some exceptions. Uh, Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, Sumac, and Grape um, are have all been very heavily hit by lanternfly. Now, of course, Tree of Heaven is also an invasive uh, species. We don't really care if they kill Tree of Heaven, but those other three are, um, are plants that we're a bit more concerned about. Um, on these plants, they can cause um, branch dieback in as little as a single summer. Um, they can also kill uh, saplings and smaller trees. And if the feeding is heavy enough and is repeated, they can even kill um, larger trees as well. It can also cause um, weeping of sap from the bark. Uh, you can see that here on the picture on the left. Uh, and as well as uh, the accumulation of this slime flux, which is this like frothy, foamy mess that appears at the base of trees. Um, it can smell in general, but when you get this on Tree of Heaven, it's even worse. Uh, some of you may have uh, experienced what Tree of Heaven sap smells like. It's like this rancid peanut butter smell. When you get the slime, uh, slime flux, uh, you can smell that from a good distance away. So it's it's just really unpleasant. Uh, with grapes, they can again kill them in as little as a single season. The grapes that survive often have a bad taste to them, and so you can't really, you know, do much with them if you're planning on selling them, turning into wine, anything like that. Um, you can't do it anymore. That's a crop that's entirely lost. Uh, what we've seen in terms of the actual physical effects to the vines, um, we're still kind of parsing this out, but some uh, major things that, that people have seen are a reduction in photosynthesis, reduction in sap flow, um, in the storage of carbohydrates and nitrogen, and just generally they make them more susceptible to uh, winter stresses if they are able to survive that growing season. So spotted lanternfly is really, really bad for anyone who is trying to grow grapes. Um, and they can also affect wild grapes, which I know they're they're considered some people consider them more kind of a weedy species. I always like going for a walk in the woods and you suddenly you can smell this wonderful grape smell in the woods. So I'm I'm sad at the loss of those wild grapes as well. Now, um, for this slide, I want to emphasize this is very, very early research. It's one study that's come out about this so far. Um, they need to do a lot of follow-up studies to really figure out what's going on, but it's been in the news recently, and so I thought I should mention it just so that people are aware of it and kind of have it in the back of their mind. Um, so this, this particular study found that heavy spotted lanternfly feeding on maple trees, including sugar maples, can affect the uh, amount of uh, sugar and starch in the sap of the maples. Now, it's unclear what this is actually going to mean for people who are um, using um, sugar maples to either, at a commercial scale, um, produce maple syrup or just for their own personal use. Uh, there's, like I said, there's a lot we need to know, but I bring this up just so that anyone who's, you know, concerned about their ability to produce maple syrup can have it in the back of their mind that they need to be on the lookout to um, listen for updates about 
how this is going to affect um, maple trees going forward. But again, don't panic yet. Still a very early study. Spotted lanternfly have additional effects beyond just the direct damage to their host plants. Um, they produce something called honeydew, which is this lovely, beautiful, poetic way of saying sticky, sugary insect pee. Uh, if you have ever had an outbreak of aphids and you felt there's this like sticky stuff underneath where the aphids are, that's honeydew. So imagine taking those aphids and scaling them up, but keeping a similar number of insects. That's what you get with uh, spotted lanternfly. I've been to some of the sites where they have heavy infestations. I was actually trying to take some photos um, and I was desperately shielding my camera lens because it felt like there was like this like light mist of, of soda coming down on you. It's pretty unpleasant. Uh, it also attracts stinging insects. They really, really love the honeydew. Uh, I actually saw a hornet in a yellow jacket fighting over access to uh, a lanternfly so that they could directly get that honeydew even before the lanternfly, you know, shoots it out. Uh, so they, they really like it. Honeybees also like to gather up the, um, uh, the honeydew and uh, it does, it looks like at least if they gather enough of it, it can somewhat change the flavor of the honey. Now it's not a bad taste, I would say, but it is different than what you're expecting. So um, that's another potential impact of uh, spotted lanternfly. Now the honeydew also can grow sooty mold. If this gets onto the understory, um, it can reduce photosynthesis in some areas, um, particularly areas with high amounts of tree of heaven. Oftentimes the understory is actually made up of a lot of other invasive plants. So that's again, not a huge deal, but there are some areas where there are more of the, the native plants that we want to be growing, or it might be a tree that's over somebody's garden, or there are cases where there are street trees that are heavily hit with lanternfly um, that have little plantings around the base of them, um, plantings of flowers, and then those flowers get covered in the honeydew, and then it grows sooty mold, um, which isn't very good for them. So that's another issue. This sooty mold can also get onto property. The top two steps of, um, of these stairs have uh, sooty mold on them and the bottom step has been power washed to get that honeydew and sooty mold off. You have to do this repeatedly over the course of the summer because it does build up again and again and again. And it's surprisingly difficult to wash off once it dries on. You hear you know, sugar water, you think it's gonna be pretty easy to get rid of. But it, it really sticks on there pretty, pretty solidly uh, when it, when it uh, dries. So just to kind of sum all of this up, some of the direct impacts that we've seen on plants are that spotted lanternfly are a stressor. Um, if the plant is otherwise totally healthy, not a big deal. If there are other stresses in com uh, combination with other things, that's when we start to see some serious issues. There are some exceptions can outright kill grapes, and it can also kill Tree of Heaven, Sumac, and Black Walnut. For additional impacts, um, places like yards, parks, outdoor venues, for example, if you have a pick-your-own-orchard that ends up with a lot of lanternfly in them, tend to be kind of less pleasant to be in because of the amount of honeydew that's all over everything, um, because you have these lanternflies flying around that land on people. Um, which just a side note there, people often ask, do they bite? Because when they land on you, you can kind of feel these little, tiny little prick, prickly feelings. They're not biting. They just have itty bitty little claws that when they climb, sort of just gently scratch your skin, it's not gonna do any damage. So there's, there's that at least. But anyway, I digress. Um, they can land on people. They attract more stinging insects to these places. Um, they can make property really sticky and unpleasant, like steps and benches and railings. So there's the direct impact on plants, and then there are all of these sort of additional side impacts from the honeydew that make them a general nuisance. Okay, so that brings us to our first quiz question.
Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. We will get that poll question running shortly. Yeah, oh, hang on. There you go. And everybody should be seeing the poll question on the screen. If you can't answer it, um, you can always put your answer into the questions box. And the question is, newly hatched spotted lanternfly nymphs are small and black with white spots, true or false? Another friendly reminder, if you're looking for pesticide or association credits, make sure you answer the poll question either using the blue voting box or answer it in the chat box or questions box for us. Thank you. And we'll give people another 10 seconds to answer this question before we close it. And the question is closed. And 91% answered true and 9% answered false. All right, great. Yeah, most of you got it. So when spotted lanternfly first hatch out, they are black with little white spots on them. Um, it, it did occur to me while I was listening to um, you read out the question, when they very, very first emerge, it takes a little while for the color to actually show up on their bodies. They're kind of almost like transparent at that point, but very shortly within a few hours, they turn black with white spots. So anyone that answered false might have been thinking of that. I apologize for not making that totally clear. Um, but yes, when spotted lanternfly um, are uh, first emerging, they are black with white spots on them. So now we are going to get into where these things actually are right now. Um, and to start with, I wanted to show this map, which is the predicted potential distribution of spotted lanternfly. This is from a few years ago in 2019. So there's there's some things that we've learned since then that then that make it a little bit out of date. Um, but for the most part, I would say this is this is a pretty pretty solid, pretty accurate map of potentially where this insect could end up. Now, unfortunately for us, you'll notice that most of Massachusetts is either very high suitability or high suitability. Uh, the only exception, and I, depending on your screen size, you may or may not be able to see this clearly, uh, in the Berkshires, there's a few little areas that are low suitability or unsuitable. Um, so you, you know, you, you may luck out out there. You might not have to deal with lanternfly, but um, that's, that's not necessarily a guarantee because this insect always likes to behave in ways that we are not expecting. Now, in terms of where it actually is right now, uh, this map is a, a little bit out of date, but they haven't released a new one yet. Um, however, it shows pretty broadly where uh, spotted lantern fly has been found so far. The blue areas are counties where there is an active infestation of spotted lantern fly, which means there are spotted lantern fly out in the envir environment reproducing. Usually they've been there for several years. Uh, and the red diamonds show places where uh, individual lanternflies have been found. For an individual lanternfly, what we mean by that is, you know, somebody found one lanternfly in a potted plant that they bought from the store, they took it home, they saw a dead lanternfly in it, for example. They reported it, the uh, officials from the state went out, checked out the area, and they didn't find any more lanternfly. Um, now, there's, there's a couple things I want you to take away from this map. First, notice that yes, there is that core area near where lanternfly was first introduced, where we have just this big concentrated blue section of lanternfly presence. However, there are also these really kind of far-flung counties, like over here in Indiana, up in Michigan, you know, even, even in Massachusetts, the counties that have lanternfly are pretty far from a bug's perspective from any other areas with established lanternfly populations. What that tells you 
is that these insects are very, very good hitchhikers. Um, they can uh, cling on to vehicles, they can end up in packages on nursery stock. I'll get into details about some of the other ways they can spread around in a minute. Um, but just, I, I think it underlines first the importance of making sure that you're not transporting lanternfly when you're traveling through an infested area. Um, and second, that they really could be anywhere. Just because lanternfly isn't in the town next to you or that we don't know about it, doesn't mean we're not gonna find it there you know, this summer. Um, so keep your eye out because these, these insects can pop up just about anywhere in really unexpected ways. Now to zoom in a little bit more on Massachusetts, uh, the colors are flipped here. The orange are the municipalities where lanternfly um, has an established population. Um, in those cities, there's, uh, it's not like it's the whole city has lanternfly, it's one small section of the city. And then in blue, those are the places where we've had reports of individual lanternfly. For the places with established populations, those are in Fitchburg, Worcester, Shrewsbury, and Springfield. And actually two of those we didn't know about until last summer. Um, and we got in uh, reports of them. So those are new finds, uh, a Worcester find and the Springfield find. Okay, uh, that, was, that was a short break between quiz questions. They ended up getting closer together than I'd originally planned, but now uh, it's time for the next poll question. So here's the next question, and there's more than one right answer to this question. Which municipality has spotted lanternfly been found in? Worcester? Shrewsbury, Springfield, Massachusetts. No, Fitchburg. And these are all towns in Massachusetts. We'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer the question. And the poll is closed. So 90% answered Worcester, 72% Shrewsbury, 82% Springfield, and 78% Fitchburg. All right, so the people who uh, selected all of them, uh, that was the right answer. So we have found lanternfly in all four of those cities. So again, that's uh, Worcester, Fitchburg, Shrewsbury, and Springfield. So for the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we can actually do to manage spotted lanternfly. Um, and in terms of what MDAR, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources um, are doing, first off, we are monitoring. We have traps set up around the state um, to in areas where there's a high risk of lanternfly being transported in. Uh, we check those throughout the summer for lanternfly and then um, uh, just uh, try and keep track of them that way. Um, we are also working on spreading public awareness by, you know, doing things like this talk. And that's been pretty effective in terms of getting reports of lanternfly. Uh, there are some invasive insects where they're, they're kind of hard to spot. And so usually when we find them, it's through the trapping networks we have. Spotted lanternfly is the exact opposite. Most of the reports that we've, um, or most of the instances where we found spotted lanternfly somewhere have actually been through public reports. They're, they're big, they're flashy, um, and particularly after last year, I, some of you may have seen there were a few late night shows that did pieces about spotted lanternfly, and um, I, I feel like after that a lot more people became aware of what they look like. So. Um, this is this has been really helpful. The more that you know, 
if people see them, they report them. And the more anyone uh, who's watching this can tell other people about them, show them what they look like, tell them to report them if they see them, the better chance we have of actually finding these things out uh, in the environment. Now, when we get reports, um, if it does appear to be lanternfly, we will follow up on it. Um, usually we'll do a few things. We want to actually go out there and check out the area to see if it's one of those individual finds, so just a hitchhiker, or if it's actually a, a larger population in the area. Um, then once we establish that, we will follow that up with a survey if it does seem to be an established population to try and figure out where the borders are of that lanternfly population. Um, then, um, if we, um, uh, once we've figured out where the lanternfly is, we'll go in and kind of evaluate what we can do for management steps. Now, ideally, we would love to be able to eradicate them, and that is, you know, usually the goal for what we're trying to do. But unfortunately, lanternfly is really, really difficult to fully eradicate. Um, but, you know, all is not lost. Even if our management efforts just slow down the spread of lantern flight, that's actually also really helpful. Um, slowing the spread buys the uh, town that we found it in more time to prepare and figure out what they're going to do long term for dealing with lantern fly. Um, any growers who are in the area, it buys them time to put together a plan for dealing with the insect. Um, and it also buys researchers more time to develop better management uh, methods so that hopefully, you know, eventually when it's more widespread, we'll have a better idea of actually what to do to um, effectively manage this insect. So some of the things that we've been doing um, in, in the various places we found them, um, first off, we'll do egg mass scraping, uh, and that's uh, you just take like something like a, a credit card or just a, a paint scraper, gently scrape the egg mass off of the tree or the rocks or metal or wherever they've been laid, and then you squish them and listen for a little popping sound so that you're crushing those eggs and you're killing the lantern flying in there. Uh, in some places, we also do various types of um, chemical management, so things like insecticides. Um, this is going to, the, the exact insecticides we're using vary from site to site and whether or not we can actually do that is going to depend on you know what the rules are in that particular municipality um if there's um any sort of you know sensitive areas or sensitive species nearby um uh if we're able to really easily access the site so there's a whole bunch of things that go into uh how we decide exactly what type of management we're doing but we are going in with the goal of eradicating these insects or at least slowing down their spread. Then uh, we follow up and monitor the areas to see if, it, you know, what we did was effective. So we know, all right, our lanternfly actually gone. And then also, how well did this method work? Should we change it a little bit uh, for next year and um, moving ahead planning that way? What can you do? Well, um, if you're somebody who is concerned about lanternfly for whatever reason, maybe you have um, a few grapevines in your backyard or you're someone who has a large scale um, operation where you're growing some of the plants that are sensitive to lanternfly, I would suggest um, looking into your management options right now so you can kind of start to get an idea of what you might like to do um, if or when lanternfly reaches you. Um, but also make sure to check back for updates when you actually have to deal with lanternfly so that you're using the most up-to-date recommendations. Uh, the next thing is you can keep track of where the latest finds are. Um, I showed you a couple different maps earlier. The first map that was of the, uh, the, the whole country where lanternfly are, that one you can find through Cornell. And then the second map of just Massachusetts is one that um, NDAR runs that is our pest dashboard that you can find um, linked on one of the pages I will share later on. I'll share some links to those that page, but those we try and keep regularly updated so that you know where lanternfly is. You can also do some um, scouting if you're close to an area where there's an infestation. If you see a lanternfly, snap a picture and send in a report. Now, in other states, they have been really pushing the message of just, you know, crush lanternfly. 
this makes sense there because they've got lantern fly basically everywhere. So those reports aren't really helpful to them anymore because they know the lantern fly is there. And at this point, they're more concerned about killing them. In Massachusetts, we don't have many lanternfly populations at the moment. So having photographic evidence of the presence of lanternfly is more useful to us than having somebody kill a single lanternfly. Um, and these insects, they've got strong little legs. They are good hoppers and they can, you know, they're, they're decent flyers, but they are very, very good hoppers. So if you see a lanternfly and you first think, all right, I'm going to kill it, and you approach it to kill it, if you startle it, there's a good chance it's gonna fly away and then you don't have a dead lantern fly and you don't have a photo of it. Um, so taking a photo first is the best way to go. And then if you're sure it's a lantern fly and you wanna kill it afterwards, you know, have that, that's fine. But take a picture first and then send in that report. Uh, you can also check any incoming or outgoing materials or vehicles that are coming from or going into infested areas. Um, if you if you have a vehicle, we recommend you know checking the sides, particularly checking the wheel wells. They really like to get into the wheel wells to lay their egg masses. Um, and for materials, um, uh, anything that you you know know has been shipped from an infested state, just as much time as you have to just quickly check it over for egg masses for um, the adults or for the nymphs, the better. Now, um, scouting, I mentioned this uh, in the last slide. Uh, if you are near an infested area, it can be helpful to do some just sort of initial um, scouting for lanternfly because uh, they are usually in low levels at first and then you get this big uh, spike in lanternfly. So if you catch them when they're at those low levels, um, it gives you more time to prepare before there are lanternfly just you know, everywhere. Um, you can do this either through visual surveys or through putting out traps. Um, I would suggest ten, uh, focusing on edge areas. So that's like edges of fields, along roadways, along trails, places like that. That's where a lanternfly tends to hang out. It's really interesting, actually, if you um, look at vineyards that have lanternfly, you have really high numbers of lanternfly around the edge of the vineyards, and then it decreases the closer you get to the center. Um, the One of the reasons for that is because they'll actually climb up trees that are near the edge of those vineyards, hop off and glide down. And that's just the, um, the edge of the vineyards are gonna be the first places they land. Uh, check some of their favorite host plants. Uh, Tree of Heaven, Grape, Black Walnut, Sumac, and Willow are typically the first places that they're going to go for. Although, again, that's going to vary site to site depending on how many of each of those plants are there and what their other options are. But those are good places to look first. You can also check for sooty mold. Although, remember, other things do produce honeydew that grows sooty mold. So just because you found sooty mold doesn't necessarily mean you have lanternfly. Look around to see if you can see anything like um, um, any aphids up above you um, or, or anything like that, because that might be what you're dealing with instead. You can also look for weird numbers of wasps and bees, particularly if you have a mix of those species. Um, please do exercise, do caution, um, the sort of caution you would take anytime you're dealing with stinging insects. Uh, you don't want to just walk right over because there's a chance that that could be a nest over there rather than wasps uh, or rather than a lanternfly. So just, you know, it's it's a sign that there might be lanternfly there, but be cautious in your approach in the same way you would anytime you're dealing with these insects. Now for management, uh, the good news is there's, well, there's a lot of different options. Uh, you can scrape egg masses. There's a whole long list of insecticides that are effective. Um, we have a management guide online that will um, go through those. You can also find management guides from other states but um, that will give you more details. But do remember, if you're looking at a management guide for a different state, uh, the allowed insecticides will vary from state to state. So just make sure that whatever you're planning on using is allowed in the state where you're planning to use it. Um, and also always follow the labels, please. That's very important. 
Horticultural oil can be used on egg masses. Um, we actually have an upcoming webinar through MDAR about spotted lanternfly, where uh, we have someone who's going to talk about how to most effectively do that. So if that's something you're interested in, um, please uh, check that out. You can find a link to registration on our website. Uh, if you have just a few plants you're trying to protect, you can also use netting. This doesn't seem to work terribly well at a large scale. It's just too many plants to manage. Um, but if you have, say, you know, one tree that's pretty uh, susceptible as a sapling that you planted and you want to protect, you can put some netting over it. Um, there are trap options as well. I have a few of them here. There's a circle trap where the lanternfly climb up the tree and then end up in these big what end up being kind of gross smelly bags to be quite frank of dead lanternfly. Um, there are also sticky traps, although if you put one of those out, make sure that you look up how to best do it. Um, typically people recommend putting some sort of mesh around the sticky trap. That prevents any kind of bycatch. There have been a few unfortunate instances where uh, animals like birds and butterflies and bats um, got caught in those sticky traps and, you know, we, we don't want to be injuring any sort of other animal when we're trying to catch lanternfly. So just make sure to do that uh, safely. Now, when you're thinking about management, you want to also consider um, what level the risk is at and also what level of risk to the host plants you're willing to tolerate. And I, I really like this guide. It comes from um, Penn State. They have a lot of very good resources. They're the first ones that had to deal with this insect. So um, they put together all sorts of really great things and they've um, been wonderful about updating them since then. So this guide has on, um, on one axis, it shows the level of lanternfly. So is it low, tolerable, undesirable, or intolerable levels of lanternfly? And then on the other, the risk to um, the susceptibility of the host plants. Do you only have a few of spotted lanternflies favorite host plants? Do you have a lot of them? Are the plants under some sort of other stress? Um, how close are they to other vulnerable plants? Things like, uh, is there a nursery nearby? Are there vineyards? And then as you go through the chart, you can um, you know, look at, all right, say you have uh, tolerable levels of lanternfly, but you're near to some sort of vulnerable plant. Well, in that case, maybe the risk is a little bit higher. It's in that sort of medium level. But where we are right now in most of Massachusetts, we've only got very low levels of lanternfly. So there's very low risk of any kind of damage. And that can guide you through when you want to think about actually implementing some sort of management effort. You don't need to you know, go in really heavily use spraying insecticides, things like that, if the risk is really low, basically. Whereas if the risk is higher, you might consider some of those options for protecting plants. It's going to vary depending on your particular site and depending on the amount of lanternfly there. Some of the transport pathways, I, I mentioned we'd get into this earlier. Um, they will lay their egg masses on just about anything and they have strong little legs that are very good at clinging to things. Um, so outdoor furniture is a big pathway for uh, lanternfly. And that could be, you know, if somebody goes out of state to an infested area to buy something, then bring it, brings it back home, or if somebody's moving, or if somebody's making it in one area and shipping it out. Any of those things can move lanternfly with it. Um, nursery stock. Uh, if you are planning on planting something this year and you're getting nursery stock from um, that you know came in from another state or you know even if you aren't quite sure where it was originally grown, if you have the time it's worthwhile to check it over, see if you see any egg messes, see if you see any adults, um, that way that you're reducing the risk of spreading lanternfly through the nursery stock. Now of course um, in the infested states, there are all sorts of rules about making sure that uh, the, the trees are, you know, treated and inspected to prevent the spread of lanternfly this way. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing their best, but every now and then something does slip through, through the track, cracks. So it's best if you can check it upon arrival as well. Firewood. Firewood is a huge pathway for a lot of different invasive species. Um, everything from emerald ash borer to Asian longhorn beetle to spotted lanternfly, the subject of this talk. Um, a lot of times when you bring up firewood, people say like, okay, but how far is too far? And that's 
a difficult question to answer, um, but you can kind of think of it like if you have a woodlot on one side of town and you're bringing your firewood from that woodlot to your home on the other side of town, as long as there are no quarantines there, um, there's a good chance that's that's going to be okay. There's a good chance that any sort of insect that would be in the woodlot would be able to travel on its own between your home and the woodlot. However, if you're taking firewood from, say, Amherst, Massachusetts, and you're moving it to Boston or vice versa, that is too far to bring firewood that hasn't been treated. An insect is not going to be travel be able to travel that far on its own. So you're basically accelerating the spread of the insect. Same is true for moving it between states. If you have firewood you cut in Massachusetts and then you bring it up to Maine, that's way too far. You're potentially bringing all these invasive insects up to Maine with you, which presumably if you're visiting there, you, you like it for its beautiful environment. So you don't want to spread those invasive insects with you. Uh, vehicles, I mentioned earlier, this can be everything from passenger vehicles to 18 wheelers, um, trailers. If you're, you know, taking a trailer out camping or fishing or something like that, they can have lantern fly on them. Uh, trains are a potent big risk factor as well, um, because oftentimes the, the edges of rail lines are managed to protect the tracks, not necessarily to get rid of invasive plants. So oftentimes you have tree of heaven growing there. Um, and I've actually talked to some people in Pennsylvania who said that they've seen lantern fly climb up a tree of heaven by some railroad tracks, jump off and do that, that gliding behavior I mentioned earlier and land on a train and then who knows where it's going. So that's, that's another potential pathway. So there are all these different avenues for lantern fly to spread much further um, than they would be able to on their own power. So one question that I that often comes up is, you know, okay, lanternfly really like tree of heaven. Tree of heaven is also invasive. Why don't we just get rid of tree of heaven? Well, um, there's there's some issues with that. First off, removing tree of heaven is not going to stop spotted lanternfly. Um, initially, we thought, hey, maybe it needs tree of heaven to complete its life cycle, but we've since found out they are able to survive and lay eggs without access to tree of heaven. So they don't need tree of heaven to survive. So removing tree of heaven, it's not gonna stop lanternfly. Tree of heaven is also very difficult to control. Um, you have to do it just right. Otherwise you get, you go from one tree of heaven to a little thicket of tree of heaven as you get saplings sprouting up from the roots. Um, even if you do it right, you usually have to um, go back year after year after year to finally kill it. There are also some potential health uh, impacts that they can cause. The sap can, um, in some people, can cause a reaction on people's skin. And also there have been a few cases where the, the fumes from the sap can actually cause heart issues in people. So all of that said, you know, it's, it's an invasive plant. If you wanna go out and try and tackle a tree of heaven and get rid of it, you know, go for it. I'm never gonna tell somebody not to work on managing invasive plants. They are a huge issue as well. But don't go into it thinking it's gonna be easy and don't go into it thinking that you're gonna stop spotted lanternfly by removing tree of heaven. What you can use tree of heaven for are things like monitoring. Uh, you can check it, and it uh, because there's um, a decent chance that when they first show up, they're gonna go to the tree of heaven first. Um, there are also been um, some discussion about using them as trap trees in areas. Um, basically what you do there is you'd remove most of the tree of heaven, but leave a few male plants, then treat those plants with insecticides, systemic insecticides. Then when the lanternfly feeds on it, they'll die. So th those are kind of some of the options for tree of heaven removal. Um, we also often get asked about native predators. There was discussion about this before. Um, yes, some animals do eat lanternfly. Ants, spiders, stink bugs, birds, they all like to eat ant lanternfly, but they don't eat enough. They just eat lanternfly kind of as they encounter it. So if they run into lanternfly, they'll eat it. But then if they run into a grasshopper, they'll eat that. It's just whatever they're coming across. In order to control insect populations or an insect like spotted lanternfly, you really need specialized predators. And those tend to be insects that are co-evolved um, with something like lanternfly. 
So to that end, we are working with researchers in China and by we, I mean the, the, the wider invasive species community, not MDAR specifically, to be clear. Uh, so the USDA and some uh, universities are working with researchers in China to try to find some potential parasitoids that can um, attack spotted lanternfly. Now, if we find these parasitoids, they're not going to totally get rid of lanternfly, but they may be able to knock down their population numbers so that they're at least manageable. Um, but before we do that, we need to figure out, you know, how do we rear these things and are they going to affect any non-target species? We don't want them to affect anything other than spotted lanternfly, um, so we're really rigorously testing that. There is another potential biocontrol option. We have seen some native fungi attacking spotted lanternfly. Um, if you ever see one that's kind of like white and fuzzy, there's a good chance one of these um, funguses has killed that lanternfly. Um, there are actually, um, some of them are already used as sprays um, in fields to knock down insect populations. So there's testing to see how effective that would be. But again, we need to make sure there are not gonna be effects on non-target insects as well. Um, so it's promising, but not actually ready for use yet. So in summary, it's really easy to kill a single lanternfly, but it is difficult to kill enough to make a difference because there are a lot of them. They're really mobile. They have a whole bunch of different host plants. And even if you get rid of all of them in, you know, one little field, they will reinvade that field from um, out the surrounding areas. So to wrap up really quickly, I'm gonna run through the identification of spotted lanternfly. I keep telling you, if you see it, report it. Well, what does it look like? Uh, the first through third instar are pretty tiny. That's my thumb in that picture. Uh, they are black with white spots on them. Sometimes people confuse them with ticks, but if you notice, they've got a whole lot more spots on them than ticks do. The fourth instar is bright red with black and white markings. Um, the um, one way that I like to kind of look at them is I first look at the color pattern. You know, do I see those black spots? Do I see those white spots? Is it overall red? And then I also look at the shape. So it's kind of rounded with this big head sticking out the top. So that's useful for comparing them to native lookalikes. For the adults, this is how you're normally going to see the adults. They don't have their wings open when they're at rest. They're instead covered by the, the top layer of wings, their four wings, which are, uh, are pretty, pretty dull color. They're kind of a gray brown. They have spots on the first two thirds. And then on the last third, it's this kind of pretty lacy pattern to it. Um, the females who are ready to lay eggs also, uh, it's, it's a little hard to see here. I might need to get a better picture in the future, but they have these um, bright yellow abdomens that um, are look kind of like swollen. And um, that's only when they're ready to lay eggs, you don't see it on male spotted lanternfly. When they are in flight or when they are dead or dying, they will flare out their wings. This one, for example, is flaring its wings because it was feeding on a tree that was treated with a systemic insecticide. Um, those, those wings have a stripe of bright red color with black spots, then a swoosh of white, and then they are black at the tips. Now, some lookalikes. Um, uh, there are um, box elder bugs, milkweed bugs are two of the biggest lookalikes, both for the fourth instars and the adults. I think because they tend to congregate in these really large numbers, and so people see red, big numbers of them, their first thought is lanternfly. But if you look more closely, you can see that um, they lack the white spots, and with the milkweed bug, they only have between three to four black spots on them. They don't have nearly as many as you see on spotted lanternfly. For the adult spotted lanternfly, people often get them mixed up with moths as well, particularly uh, tiger moths, which is a whole group of moths, not just this one species, and underwing moths, um, and also giant leopard moths. For the tiger wing moths and the underwing moths, yes, they do have those bright colors on their hind wings, but notice there's no white swoosh to them. They're just all red and black. And then on their forewings, that top layer of wings, they don't have any spots. The tiger moths have these really cool kind of stained glass pattern and the underwing moths almost look like tree bark. I have more than once been startled by underwing moths as I approach a tree. I don't see them at all, even though in my spare time, I, I look at moths all the time. 
and all of a sudden there's this moth in my face. So um, th those are two ways to tell. The uh, giant leopard moth, notice they're more of a white than a gray brown, and they lack that kind of lacy pattern at the tips of their wings. Another thing to look at is if you happen to catch them, whether in your hand or in a container, um, if you see feel anything kind of dusty or see any like something that looks dusty coming off them, there's a good chance you have a moth and not a spotted lanternfly. That dust is um, the scales coming off of the wings. Uh, this is why you were told not to hold moths and butterflies as a, as a kid. Those scales are really delicate. They shed off very easily. Moths have them, butterflies have them, spotted lanternfly do not have scales on their wings. Now, the egg masses are a lot harder to spot. They are pretty nondescript. They blend right into things. Um, they are about an inch and a half long, each contain between 30 to 50 eggs, which is enough to start a whole spotted lantern uh, population of lanternfly uh, with a single egg mass. And they are grayish brown and have this putty like covering. Now for the first one, it's a fully covered egg mass with this little squiggle going off it. Sometimes that squiggle is there, sometimes it's not. And then for the next set of photos, it shows some either half or fully uncovered egg masses. Unfortunately, they can still survive even without the putty-like coating. Um, it's just, it helps them a little bit, but if the female's disturbed, she'll have laid the eggs, but not the uh, put, that, put that waxy coating on it. For the final picture, this shows a hatched egg mass. They have this little round circle open at the top, and then sometimes it looks like there's a pull tab coming off of it. Um, this can be helpful because it lets you know, all right, did this hatch this year? Did it hatch in the past? and gives you an idea of um, how old the eggs are that you're dealing with. Unfortunately, they can lay them just about anywhere, anywhere from the base of trees all the way up into the canopy, on any sort of wooden post, outdoor furniture, metal post, cinder blocks, um, on couch cushions that are outside vehicles, pretty much anywhere that's a flat surface. And they also really like tucking them inside of um, sort of crevices and cracks. Uh, I have even seen a photo of a lanternfly egg on a light bulb. So they will, they are not picky. They'll lay them pretty much anywhere. Some lookalikes. Um, I'm just going to quickly speed through this because I know we're getting to the end of the time. Spongy moth egg masses are the most common lookalikes. Uh, the big difference between them is that spotted lanternfly eggs are more like a splash of mud or putty in texture, whereas spongy moth eggs are furry, um, egg masses rather, are furry. Praying mantis egg cases as well, uh, at first glance, you might think they look similar, but praying mantis egg cases are actually much more kind of three-dimensional. They're like little styrofoam packing peanuts rather than just a bit of putty scraped on some bark. There's a whole bunch of different types of lichen. I don't really have time to go into all of them for the lookalikes, but just note that if you can look at the thickness, if it's like thicker than a quarter of a dime thick, probably not spotted lanternfly. If it looks like it's just being painted on, probably not lanternfly. If it has like leafy like textures or peeling at the corner, probably not lanternfly. So if you think you've seen a lanternfly, or even if you're not sure, please snap a photo, note your location, and send in a report to us. Um, again, if you're not sure, we still want those reports. Um, I'm the one that looks through them. If you think, you know, is that a lanternfly? Is it a moth? If you send it to me and it turns out to be a moth, hey, I got to look at a cool picture of a moth. Uh, we really don't mind. Anytime you're not sure, send in a picture because we'd rather have people double check than risk having um, uh, there be a population of lanternfly or another invasive insect out there that we don't know about. We also have all sorts of resources. Um, if you have a place to distribute them and you'd like to help out by sharing them with people and you live in Massachusetts or work in Massachusetts, you can order them for free. Um, you can also download them off of our websites. And if you want to design your own, we are always happy to provide photos. You just need to give us credit on the photos. We have a newsletter as well that you can sign up for. It's about all sorts of different invasive species, not just spotted lanternfly comes out once a month. It's five bullet points or less with links to further reading if you want to uh, go into more detail and it's timely forest pest information. You can sign up at the link on the screen or you can use the QR code there if you're you know, on a laptop. So just in summary, if nothing else, if you remember nothing else from this talk, 
remember to check back for updates about spotted lanternfly. If you're traveling through an infested area, please make sure to check before you leave and when you arrive for lanternfly. And if you see a lanternfly, snap a picture, send in a report to us. Okay, which brings us to our last poll question. There is the last question. If you see a spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts, what's the first thing you should try to do? Stomp it, catch it, take a photo of it, or nothing and ignore it. I hope we get 100% correct on this one. <laughs> Me too. Okay, we'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer this question. And the poll is closed. So not quite 100%, 94% said take a photo of it, 5% said stomp it, and 1% said catch it. All right, so uh, yes, uh, the correct answer is take a picture of it. That's the first thing you should do. So snap a photo and then send it in as a report to um, us at MDAR. Um, if you want to stomp it after, if you wanna try and catch it after, that's totally fine. But the first thing that you should do is take that photo because I can tell you from trying to get some of the pictures I had throughout the slides here, they are a little escape artists. Um, they are faster than you expect. So um, having that photo for first is very, very helpful to us. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you have, or if you think of something later, my contact information is on the screen. Thank you so much. There are ample questions, so we'll get right into them. But before I do, I just need to remind folks that are looking for pesticide and association uh, credits and I've had some questions come in to please stay with us so don't log off early listen to the questions because at the very end there will be further instructions to receive those credits as well as a survey that you must fill out in order to receive those credits so please don't leave early okay awesome talk Elizabeth we've had some compliments coming in from folks that are listening and as I mentioned ample questions so I will get into those but while I do ask you your first question, do you mind flipping back to your um, slide about lookalike egg masses? There are a couple folks that wanted to see that again, and I figure you can leave that up while we get into some of the other questions. Thank you. All right, sure. so let's see, first question. Uh, this is from Serena, and I'm not quite sure where Serena is located. I'm sorry, I've forgotten if she's answered, but in our forest, we've seen populations on Japanese angelica trees. Do you have any information regarding that? You know, I, I don't know about that specifically, um, but they, they certainly have a very, very broad host range. Um, they will try and feed on just about anything from little tiny basil plants all the way up to full-grown oak trees. So it's possible that they may be uh, feeding on it. Um, you know, there's there's clear, there's clear usually some pretty clear preferences for the types of plants that they like to go for, um, but they'll use, you know, things like some of those smaller plants as kind of a stop gap between um, when they first hatch out if they don't immediately find something that they prefer. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I haven't heard about that specifically, but it's entirely possible that they'll feed on those. Thank you. And Serena is located in Southern New York. Um, let's see, uh, Glenn asks uh, about a graphic, I think at the beginning of your talk that showed an adult and an early instar lantern fly together. Um, Glenn is asking, does this really happen or do the adults die in the hard freeze? Um, oh, so I think, let me see if I can go back to that. I think I know, nope, maybe not. Um, so uh, 
I don't know that I've seen first in star nymphs with adult lantern flies um, because, uh, you know, as, as the question asked said, the adults do die with the first hard freeze. And usually by the time the adults emerge um, the next year, most of the nymphs have turned into at least the fourth instar. Um, but you do certainly get overlaps between the fourth instar nymphs and the adult spotted lanternfly. I actually, I, I didn't include it in this talk, but I actually have a photograph of an adult spotted lanternfly right next to a fourth instar spotted lanternfly. So that does happen sometimes. There's there's a bit of overlap there. And just as a reminder, the fourth instar is that um, red instar with the um, black and white spots on them. Thank you. Let's see. Next question. Um, oh, Edward, what foliar applied pesticides are effective against the spotted lantern flight? And I did want to tell Elizabeth, we've shared the links to UMass Extensions Management um, Guide for Spotted Lantern Fly, the Homeowners Management Guide from MDAR for Spotted Lantern Fly, as well as Penn State's, <laughs> I believe, Management Guide. So they have those links in the chat. Yeah, so what I would recommend doing is going to, you know, one or all of those links and looking at the, the list of insecticides that they have there. They, they go into details about which ones are most effective because they're, it's, it's quite a long list of what you can use on them. And it's going to differ depending on what state you're in. And it's going to also differ depending on the area that you're applying it. So, um, so rather than list them all out, I would recommend going to one of those guides and they'll tell you in detail which ones you can use where. I also want to use this as a moment to plug our next webinar, our next date in this webinar series, Wednesday, February 8th. Again, we'll be starting at nine o'clock on February 8th. We have two presenters that will be talking about more spotted lanternfly management information. Brian Walsh from Penn State Extension will be talking about managing SLF in landscapes, as well as uh, Dr. Eric Clifton, a uh, research scientist with BioWorks, will be talking about using entomopathogens or biopesticides uh, for spotted lanternfly. So I hope folks will tune in with us again on the 8th. Okay, another question for you, <laughs> Elizabeth. Uh, Thomas asks, is the lanternfly damage to grapevines and maple trees just in a single season or permanent damage for all seasons going forward if untreated? Um, ooh, so that's that's a little bit tricky to answer. Um, they can weaken the plants going forward. Um, the other, but the plants could theoretically recover with them in time. But I will say we tend to see lanternfly hitting the same individual plant again and again and again. So uh, just just as an example, there might be a row of street trees. And they're all, you know, say they're all maple. There will be particular maples that they will repeatedly go for year after year after year. And, you know, the maples seem all identical. And so we don't really know why they prefer those particular trees. So theoretically, they could recover, but it's highly likely that the lantern fly are going to go after the same individual trees repeatedly, which would make it difficult for them to recover. And I do want to say again, since they specifically mentioned maples, we don't know what the long-term impacts are going to be on maples yet. That's that's a really early study um, and there's still a lot we need to learn about it. Thank you. Um, let's see here. The next question from Faith, I believe was asking, about spotted lanternfly when they first hatch from the egg and are still white in color uh, before they develop the black color with white spots, what size are they at that point, roughly? Oh, they're they're still about the the same size as the photo. I let's see. Here we go. So there's they're still about that little tiny size. And here I can actually now that I have my video on, I can show you how big my thumb is just for reference. Um, they're still about that same size when they very first emerge and they're that pale cover color. They're only that color for a very short period of time. That's why I didn't even bother putting it on the slide. I only mentioned it because a few people answered in a different way and it occurred to me that, hey, maybe they're thinking of these 
you know, kind of ghostly looking lantern flies um, from the initial hatch. So it's, it's only a couple hours really, but they're the same size. They're just really pale. Thank you. Uh, great question from Serena here. What are the procedures for the state quarantines? Oh, so that, I do not know as much about quarantines in other states. We don't actually have a quarantine at the moment in Massachusetts. So I would point you in the direction of um, the particular state that you're interested to, to learn more about that. I don't, like I said, I, I don't know all the details. They usually involve, depending on what it is that's leaving the quarantine area, they usually involve things like inspections, um, sometimes some sort of um, insecticide treatment, but, but I would refer you to those other states for more details. Just to clarify for Massachusetts, it's highly discouraged to move any life stages of spotted lanternfly, is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for mentioning that. Um, yes, if you find a spotted lanternfly, we, we don't want you to move it between areas. If you are in an area, one of those areas where we have an established population of lanternfly, um, we would, you know, discourage you from moving things out of there unless you actually absolutely have to. And then if you can inspect them first um, to make sure they don't have any egg masses or anything else on them, um, that can really help us slow down their spread. We just don't have an official quarantine yet. But yes, please, please try to do your best to avoid spreading lanternfly around, even though there's not an official quarantine at the moment. Thank you. Let's see. Question from Priscilla. Are greenhouse growers inadvertently providing habitat for this pest? Um, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say so any more than the the wider environment. They they do pretty well just out in the woods here. So I I wouldn't say that greenhouses are particularly better or worse necessarily than just the surrounding environment for them. Thank you. A question from Anne, um, I believe in reference to MDAR's trapping efforts for spotted lantern fly. Anne asks, how can we participate and get a trap? Is that possible? <laughs> Um, so I, I appreciate the enthusiasm. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to distribute traps yet. However, um, if you would like to take part, there are some instructions you can find online for setting up your own circle traps. Um, and if you want to set up a circle trap and monitor it on a regular basis and um, let us know if you find anything or, you know, even if even if you're monitoring regularly and you want to let us know at the end of the season, like, hey, we didn't find any lanternfly, you could do that as well. Um, but yeah, un unfortunately, we can't distribute traps, but there are ways that you can build your own if you'd like to. That link uh, from Penn State about building your own circle trap has been shared in the chat. So excellent. All right. Another question from uh, Jen. Can't spotted lantern flies, and I believe the question is either move or be above the trap area on the trees. So could they theoretically evade the trap? Um, they, they might be able to, but they tend to climb up and down the trees in a, a, a fairly predictable way. Um, with the traps, you know, there's, there's kind of pros and cons for the traps. And one of the cons is that um, if they fill up with lanternfly, they're able to just, you know, climb over the other dead lanternfly and go up the tree. Um, Another thing is some of the later life stages with the sticky traps are actually strong enough to like pull their legs out of the, the traps. They're, they've got very strong legs. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, but just the way that they behave, they're, they're not very smart. They're not going to know that they should avoid the traps. So they do tend to just climb up tall things when they run into them. And if you set up the trap right, that'll usually catch them. Um, it's just as kind of a, a side note away from the question, that's one of the reasons why you'll sometimes in the heavily infested areas find a whole bunch of them dead at the base of skyscrapers. They, they think they're really weird tall trees. Um, also why they'll land on people and try and climb up them. They think that we're trees. They're, they're not super bright uh, insects. All right, let me see another question here. 
from Aaron. How long does it take for spotted lanternflies to lay their eggs? If traveling, can a car parked overnight get tagged? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, although, you know, in, in terms of timing, that amount of time, they can absolutely lay their eggs. It, it doesn't take very long at all. I, I don't know off the top of my head the actual amount of time it takes, but it's less than half an hour. They're very fast. Um, if it was parked overnight and it was dark the entire time the car was there, probably wouldn't happen just because they're more active during the daytime. But if the car was there at all in the early morning after the sun came up, it could get egg masses on them. Yes, they're, they're very speedy. Thank you. Another question here. Um, let's see. Oh, from Patricia, what month will we start seeing spotted lanternflies in Massachusetts if they're in an area? Well, uh, let me pull up my chart really quickly because I think it's just helpful to be able to look at that full life cycle. Um, oop, too far. There we go. All right. Um, so we usually start seeing them first hatch out in around May to June. If it's a warm year, it's probably going to be closer to May. If it's a really cold spring, it's probably going to be in around June. So that's it's very temperature dependent on when they hatch. Now, that said, that's when the um, the nymphs first hatch out. But people don't usually notice the nymphs really easily. So you're more um, likely to actually start seeing them in around mid-August. That's when the most of the adults um, have started, uh, and most of the adults have emerged, and they're really getting a little bit more active. They're flying around more. They're starting to look for good places to lay their eggs. Thank you. Um, a comment about trapping or question about trapping from Nicole. Um, worried that this is giving a false impression that these traps are more effective than they are for detection. Uh, how many spotted lanternfly have you actually caught in the traps and how many of those were in areas that you were unable to visually spot them? Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, the traps are much more effective in areas that already have some sort of outbreak. Um, we have the traps set up for monitoring, but we, I, I believe, yeah, I don't think we have caught any spotted lanternfly in our traps yet. All of the spotted lanternfly detections that we've had in Massachusetts have either been reports from the public um, or reports from other people in um, the, the state government that have been um, doing surveys for other things and notice the lanternfly. So visually, thank you, thank you for asking that um, clarifying question. Um, just visual surveys are much more effective for detecting spotted lanternfly than traps are. Just we we have the traps as kind of an additional layer of monitoring. Thank you. Let's see. I'll try to squeeze in maybe one or two more questions, um, and then we have our closing information and announcements for folks who need um, continuing education credits. So let's see here from Kathleen. In Southern Jersey, we are seeing spotted lanternfly on oak trees in the fall, trying to lay their egg masses. Have you seen this in Massachusetts? Um, and just sort of asking about the different studies as to whether or not oak is a particularly attractive host for this insect. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure if anyone's looked into that. Um, I, I haven't observed any particular difference in terms of where they're laying eggs. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not the case. Um, what I would say is that oaks tend to have um, sap flowing later in the season than some other plants. So um, sometimes they will move on to oaks. Basically, if there's nothing else available to them, um, they'll um, switch over to things like oaks and other plants that have sap flowing later in the season. So that might be why you're seeing them congregate on oak trees. Um, but like I said, I, I don't know of anyone that's done any sort of actual like systematic study of that. So I, yeah. Thank you. Um, questions about tree of heaven. So Kathy asks, we have two uh, recently discovered roadside tree of heaven on conservation land. We are nearby an, an active infestation, but 
it says none yet, so I'm assuming none on that conservation land yet. Uh, she's asking, is it better to leave the trees and monitor them or to eradicate the tree of heaven? Um, th that, I mean, that depends on what your goals are. Um, removing the tree of heaven is not going to stop spotted lanternfly from moving into an area. They don't eat tree of heaven. Uh, they, they will feed on plenty of other types of host plants, um, particularly when there's an outbreak of lanternfly, which is what we've seen happening in most places where this insect has invaded, they'll go for for all sorts of different types of trees. So if you're thinking about removing the tree of heaven because you think it might help reduce the likelihood of the lanternfly coming on your property, that's not a reason to do it. They're not going to stop lanternfly. Now, if you're thinking about removing the tree of heaven because you want to get rid of an invasive plant, you know, that's 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 a whole different discussion. Um, for monitoring um you know if if you decide you want to leave them you don't want to remove them um then yeah that could be a good place to check to kind of get an early heads up of when they they show up because um like i said they don't need the tree of heaven but they do tend to go for that before anything else great all right i have two last questions i i want to ask <laughs> um uh, for kathleen asking about um, using tree of heaven as a trap tree, so, um, you know, taking advantage of spotted lanternfly's preference for tree of heaven, and then treating that tree of heaven with systemic insecticides uh, to help eradicate spotted lanternfly, uh, just asking if uh, anyone in Massachusetts is doing that. Um. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? I had a, a notification suddenly pop up on my screen that wasn't supposed to be there and I got briefly distracted. <laughs> no worries. Um, so using Tree of Heaven as a trap tree um, to help draw in spotted lanternfly, but also treating the Tree of Heaven with systemic insecticides um, so that when they feed on those trees, it's lethal. Um, just mm -hmm. asking if, I guess, your, if MDAR is doing that or anyone it uh, is doing that in Massachusetts. So, um, so a, a couple of points in there. So the, the first thing is the idea of using tree of heaven as a trap tree. Um, there's some debate about how effective that actually is at knocking down lanternfly populations. Some people say like, it's, it's really effective. They kill a lot of lanternfly that way. Some people have said that they've tried it and it hasn't made a big difference there. So it's, kind of 50 50 from what i've seen about whether that's an effective management strategy or not um now for mdar we have had trap trees but for monitoring purposes these have been in areas where there are known infestations where we've um had tree of heavens on the tree of heaven on those sites and we have injected them with insecticide and then we've put buckets around the base of the tree and checked up on those buckets um, with the idea that if there were lanternfly in the area, they feed on the tree, they die, they fall into the bucket. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's kind of where the thinking is on trap trees at the moment. Thank you. All right, last question, and then um, we'll get wrapping up so folks can uh, leave on time today. From Mariana, can egg masses survive being chipped? So is wood chip mulch a potential way to spread them? Um, if they are chipped small enough, and I don't n remember at the moment the size that they need to be chipped to, um, if they're, if they're chipped in the right way, um, a combination of just the, the physical action of chipping them up and also the vibrations from the machine, uh, will kill lanternfly, um, egg masses. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you for answering so many questions. And thank you again to our audience for asking so many fantastic questions. So um, I will take over the screen share momentarily here once I get my PowerPoint ready. And we are going to go over the, as promised, uh, pesticide and association credit process for folks who are in need of that. I do want to mention to everyone who is still with us and listening um, that, sorry, apparently I can't hit buttons and form sentences at the same time. Okay. <laughs> um, 
we do encourage everyone to remain on for these next uh, couple of minutes as I make these announcements, because there is a brief survey that we hope everybody who's participated today will answer um, at the end of uh, the webinar today. So, uh, but just some instructions for the folks that need association and pesticide credits. We do uh, 